delighted to have my colleague, uh, Professor Michael Harper, here to uh, talk to us about his poetry, to answer our questions about his poetry, to hopefully, as he just said, to read some of his poetry. Um, I'm not really going to give an introduction. I hope that's okay, Michael. It's all right. Um, I want to say a couple things, uh, but um, it, I gave websites, so they should all have looked at get some background about you. I do want to say two things about you. I like to know, people will all know this because when they came to have conferences with me, I asked them where they're from. Mm. So I like people to know where people are from. And you were born, if I'm not mistaken, in Brooklyn. But Correct. you moved to California at 13. At, at a fairly young age, which, as those of you in the class know, that's important to me. That means you actually went to the land of all goodness and life. Exactly. <laughs> I waited for the laugh there. Uh, although you did go to Los Angeles, which... Um, uh, and then you went, you went to Los Angeles State, am I not? Am I LA City to? College yes. and then LA State College. There you go, yeah. So California education, which I think one cannot overstate the importance of that. Um, again, waiting for the laugh here. <laughs> 1970, came to Brown. Have that written down, is that right too? Yeah, Correct. 1970. So you've been here longer than I have. Oh, yeah. Professor Harper was an extraordinary presence, a tremendous help. Uh, I don't think you realized how much of an advisor you were to me, because in department meetings, when I came to Brown, the English department, um, it was a pretty uh, dysfunctional place, let's put it that way. And uh, Still is. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that. I can't say that. Oops, I guess I just did say that on the on tape. Um, uh, it's a lovely place, uh, filled with joy and life. Um, uh, so I remember what you said in department meetings. I remember what uh, this man, so I, I have a, I, I, given the fact that he was um, there from the start of my tenure at Brown, I, I'm particularly happy. I could go through the number of books he's published, he's published so many, we wouldn't be able to have a class, awards. Good God, you're a member of the Society of American, American Society of Arts and Sciences, is that not correct? Yes. I mean, that, uh, 1995. 1995. And that's just one. There are many, many things. Um, I do want to say, I, I'm particularly happy that you're here today, as I told you when I got here, because today feels to me like a day where we need a little poetry. Because um, poetry cuts through the crap. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and why I asked you, I wanted to say something about why I asked you, because I'm not sure they know. Mm -hmm. I never told you. No, you didn't. Um, uh, Which is not necessarily prerequisite. Pre no. prerequisite. You don't have to tell me. I wanted to kind of keep it a little bit of mysterious. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but I want to tell you, and if you have any reaction to it, I want to hear that reaction. But you, okay. don't, you don't have to react. Um, and that is, because uh, to me, one of the things about your poetry, I mean, the course Inventing America looks at how literature helps invent the very notion of what it means to be American, what America means. Um, that it's not, or at least I'm not interested in the stuff that's reflective, but that's productive, you know, that um, gets down in the kind of dirty details and makes them something more than what, you know, something more. Reveal, but not just reveals them, but also recreates them. It gives it, shows us to them, and shows us, shows us stuff in a way that we can't see otherwise, and then you can never go through the rest, you go through the rest of your life looking at things differently. Um, so when I read your poetry, you know, like the um, American History poem, uh, John Coltrane poem that I asked him to read this time, I had never actually read notes on, on a long poem. I'd never read, read mm -hmm. them. Um, to me, that's what it did. It took details from American history, like figures, and it, so it takes history, but it makes something non-historical out of history. Right? It reveals it in its kind of mythical, deep kind I of... I wouldn't have written that poem if I had not been in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Hmm. Really? And the woman who I first met, who took me to the... Uh, faculty club. She was she was a black woman who worked in the faculty club. When I came in with the rest of these white uh, colleagues, although they were all white, she came in. She put a arm on a hand on my shoulder and she said, "I have one piece of pecan pie which I'm saving for you." <laughs> and I thought to myself, mm. you know, and I just let it let it unfold from there, you know. Well, that's why I invited you. Well, um, good. So I know they have a lot of questions. They, um, ought to, they ought to ask them. You ought to be free to ask them. So let's start. Can we start with their questions? Sure. Um, so does anybody, I asked you guys to send them to me. 
Um, and uh, they might now be a little a little shy to do that. But it's we, okay. You know, little reticence is all right. That's all right. Um, but does anybody want to start? Does anybody have a question about Professor Harper's poems that they want to start us off with? Um, uh, anything you want to know? Uh, ah, Eddie. Go, Eddie. Maybe this is just a selection of poems that we read, but I found that um, a lot of them seem to be based around specific people, like personalities of people, and they from there expanded into uh, larger themes. But I was wondering uh, if that's conscious, why base a poem around a specific personality? Well, if you look at some of my more recent books, you'll notice that I always have a note section in it. And, uh, for example, let's just take American history. Uh, when I first wrote this poem, um, it must have been about 1960, in the 1960s. It could have been 1963, 4. It could have been around there. I don't re remember, but I dedicated it to a person that I taught with, a man named Callahan. And I'd already written the poem a long time before, and I wasn't thinking about anything, really, including I hadn't published the first book. And I didn't have, uh, I published a few poems in, in uh, periodicals, but I didn't have any. First book, I'd never won a, won a contest. And I'd already had tenure in two places before I, I was teaching in Portland, Oregon, where I taught at Reed College and Lewis and Clark College. So I decided then that I would start to put notes in, because I used to get these questions from people, and they would ask me, questions which were provocative. And I knew sooner or later, and especially I knew this when uh, we got into email, that people from all over the world were going to write to me and ask me about things because I had been in anthologies and um, the black studies um, phenomenon had taken place and I would, I would get these queries from all over. And uh, I, would, I got tired of ask, answering them over and over again. So I would say to myself, well, i gotta, I got to just figure out some way to short, come up with some shorthand. So the poem, American History, those four black girls, you know, why does the poem begin there? Um, the poem is only nine lines long. And it mentions some things which are meant to disturb the reader. The word net, for example. What is the net doing in there? Uh, who are the redcoats? Why are the redcoats in the poem? Well, then I finally decided I would just tell everybody, you know, what, what happened. Because even if I told them, they couldn't necessarily understand the poem without a kind of syncretic leap. They had to leap to a recognition of what the poem is really talking about. And one of the reasons for, for that is because the United States and the country of America is in denial about a lot of things. And one of the things they're denial about, in denial about is race. So you have to be elliptical when you talk about race. And when you talk about race elliptically, um, you talk inferentially. You talk, uh, one of the things that I've been working on for a long time now is how to use the periodic sentence in my own, mm. in my own structure so as to withhold the things that I really want people to carry, you know, and wait for. So that's the first thing. Um, let me just read you a note or two, and then I'll give you some idea about what I mean. Uh, the poem, American History, which is in, this is in a selected poems, and um, on the other side of it is a poem called Blues Alabama. And why are these poems organized uh, next to one another? And before that is a poem called Black Spring, which was the first poem that I was going to call my first collection, Black Spring, mm -hmm. after um, Henry Miller, who wrote a book called Black Spring. But of course, there was conflict between us, so I had to change my title. And I liked the, the poem, but I didn't like the fact that I had to change the meaning of my, my, my book, you know. So here's American history. Those four black girls blown up in that Alabama church remind me of 500 Middle Passage blacks in a net underwater in Charleston Harbor so redcoats wouldn't find them. Can't find what you can't see, can you? Now, any time that you end a poem with a rhetorical question, the weight of the poem is on the reader. Hmm? And I did that deliberately. I, I knew that people were going to 
struggle with this. Well, if somebody's in high school and they write me a letter and they say, or they write me a, a, an email and they say, Professor Harper, you know, what did you mean by this? And we're studying your poem in such and such a class and so and so and so forth. Um, I'm very whimsical. I might just say, well, I have no memory of ever writing that poem, nor do I remember why I wrote it, which is the truth of it. And when I tell my students in classes or whatever, there's nothing wrong with the answer, I don't know, because that might be the proper answer. But since we're all supposedly ubiquitous, we're supposed to know every damn thing. Uh, you know, you can't admit that you don't know. So, so to say I don't know is the worst thing you can possibly say, and particularly in a seminar. Well, I have been in a, I have been in a situation uh, where I have been forced to come up with good reasons for real ones, which is to say rationalizations. You have to come up with good reasons rather than real ones, and the real ones maybe you don't know. But anyway, this is what I said about the, the poem, American History. American history is a reiteration of the Oresteia in the reference to net, quote unquote. That is, the cyclic unknown history of a new nation repeating the breaking of ancient codes of incest and miscegenation. The concept is indebted to Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Reference upon reference upon reference. Well, if you open up the New York Times book review, like last Sunday's, and you look under the advertisement for Kindle, in the Kindle page is, I am an invisible man. First words from Ralph Ellison's novel, Invisible Man, and it's the prologue. Well, we've come a long way since when I was going to school. And uh, the first time that I read uh, Invisible Man, I was loaned the book by somebody who had taught a course on Eugene, Eugene O'Neill, and he was connected with the Provincetown Players. His name was um, uh, uh, let me see, can I remember his name now? I'll remember in a minute. He, um, he, was, he would come to class and he would say, uh, Professor Harper, he would always call me Professor Harper. Professor, I was the only black person in class. Professor Harper, he would say, um, I was in the draft board with Ralph, with, uh, with Richard Wright, and I, was, I can remember standing in line going to the draft board with Richard Wright in the same line as me. And then I would, that would provoke a question, of course, and I would ask him this and that. Well, when he uh, wrote uh, Invisible Man, when he read Invisible Man, and he, he gave me his copy, which was signed by Ralph Ellison, 1953, he had been teaching at a black school in New Orleans. And Ellison had come to campus and had signed his book. And there was a story behind that. And of course, many years later, when I finally met Ellison and asked him about this, I asked him about uh, the man who had written the book, who had had, had the book signed, he remembered who that person was. So reference upon reference upon reference. So I have decided that I would, rather than keep secrets from people, I would say to people, for example, Black Spring was the original title of the poet's first collection, Dear John, Dear Coltrane. The title was changed because of seeming conflict with Henry Miller's novel slash memoir of the same name. Spring, in this context, is more shale than water supply. It is in the residual of conscious conquest, but c unconscious possession by bloodlines. Now, I mean to be opaque there, because I want the people to go and read Henry Miller. You know, um, I, rem I remember reading Henry Miller when uh, you could go to the library and borrow a book. You had to go to some, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, I don't know whether it's blue. They used to say, they used to call it blue. Uh, you would go to a blue bookstore, which is to say, a bookstore which which specializes in obscene literature, obscen yeah, exactly. obscen obscen So that's how I read uh, Miller. I was interested in obscenity and pornography and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and one of the things you realize about pornography, and particularly you, you young people are younger than uh, younger than I am by many many years, but um, the humor. And porn pornography was the thing that I wanted, wanted to experience because I realized that so much of the description of um, 
of sex between people was acrobatic in a way which was just beyond, beyond the charts. And, and of course, you read Miller, and he's always making love to some woman on a table, or he's, he's doing, and I would, I, would, I would have difficulty visualizing this. And of course, I want to film, you know, I want to see it. You know, but, but by the time I had gotten saturated by reading his books, and I'd read, you know, maybe 10 or 15 of his books, some of them not even available in this country, I was ready for James Joyce's portrait of an artist as a young man, or uh, Ulysses, or because by then I was ready to discuss obscenity and why it was that people should be allowed to read anything they want, you know. But I had to been saturated by that. I had to, had to be forced into coming to a good diagnosis of why it is one has to have a belief in free expression and openness to everything, particularly in the arts. So it's a long roundabout question. Can next I, one. Can I interrupt you? Yes. Before you, I'm Go ask ahead. The next question. I take the teacher's prerogative. Go ahead. Because you said America, you were talking about American history. Yes. And you said that. Um, uh, you didn't remember stuff about when you were writing it? And I, I, I guess, so I don't want to ask you, like, were, were there various versions? Tell us about writing it. There were. There were various versions. Yes. All right, so two part questions. I want to know about the versions and how it led to the poem. But the more fundamental question to me is, do you think in poems, I mean, like, when you see, because that's a, that's a historical, there's a historical details there. When you see, when you look at the world, do you see the world, do you see poems in the world? You know, like when you look at stuff, do you see that's a poem? You know, I was, I was uh, talking to Sterling Brown one time and I selected his, I selected his um, uh, collected poems uh, for the National Poetry Series. And we were just talking, you know, in his house in, in Washington, D.C. And he would say things, just, just, and I would, I'd want to write them down. They were so profound and, and like nothing I'd ever say, it, heard before. Like, for example, one, one time we were talking about his book, and he said, when God created the black child, he was showing off. So I would write that down, you know, because I knew that the, the, um, the tone and the humor and the pacing was done by a pioneer uh, poet, but also a great teacher, one who knew the classics one who knew all kinds of damn things. And when he would say things, he, for example, I remember one time we were talking about kinship, and he said to me, he says, uh, it's a wise blues that knows its father. I'd write that down. You know, it's a wise blues that knows its father? You know. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the mother of the blues is, of course, a, a person that he had written about, Ma Rainey, you know. And the empress of the blues was Bessie Smith, you know. And I had heard stories about Bessie Smith when I was a little kid because Bessie Smith was a, first of all, she was a terrific cursor. Uh, she was obscene. And she hired um, people to go and be her body servant, and they would go on the road. And she used to drink bath cup, bathtub gin, which is to say gin which could make you blind if you weren't careful. And um, he, she would hire these, these people. And sometimes they were below age. They were, they were 14, 15 years old. You know, and then they would travel around. Well, imagine being tra traveling around with Bessie Smith. So when I was asked finally, or asked myself to write a poem, can't you see what love and heartache's done to me? I'm not the same as I used to be. This is my last affair. That's a refrain, which I stole from Bessie Smith. But Bessie Smith had never recorded this, but Billie Holiday had. So I changed a word or two, and that became the refrain. So when I was writing a um, uh, a kind of uh, liner note for an album for a guy named Ralph Gleason, who at that time lived in San Francisco. Uh, Gleason would always hassle me about whether this, what, what, what I was saying was authentic or not. Coltrane was playing every week uh, in 1964 or 5, and I was living in San Francisco, and I would go and I would not miss a single one of his. Um, Engagements. He'd be there for two weeks. I would not miss a single uh, performance at all. So by the time I get to writing Dear John, Dear Coltrane, I had internalized so much of that music that I understood what I wanted to say even before I wrote anything down. You know, And when I sing in his voice, a love supreme, a love supreme, of course I know that's Coltrane's voice singing. But I also know that he grew up in the, in the black church. 
He blew up. He grew up in a church where he had no brothers and sisters. His closest relative was his cousin, whose name was Cousin Mary. And later on, he writes a tune called Cousin Mary. And you listen to that, and then you find out that he's, he's really just talking about his folks and his family. So then you go to the post office where I was working, and you're waiting for something new to come off of the, the uh, new records. And he comes up with, with, a, with a tune called Giant Steps. Giant Steps, I think, came out in 1958. And Giant Steps was so different than anybody had tried to play before, just in terms of its uh, methodology. You listen, listen to Giant Steps, and you say, this is, this is something really new. And then you go and you listen to it, let's say, in downtown. You go to a concert in downtown Los Angeles, where I went. And Coltrane was set up to play on a different stage. He was, he was there with Miles, but he was on a different stage in downtown Los Angeles. And it was reported in the newspapers that he had had a nervous breakdown. Well, what had happened was he had just broken the mode of soloing as uh, prescribed in the way that generally people did when they appeared in concerts. And he had decided to break that mode. So it was reported in the newspapers that he, was, he had had a nervous breakdown. Well, I was there, so I knew it wasn't a nervous breakdown. But I also knew that Miles Davis would sometimes do crazy things. Like, for example, he'd turn his back to the audience. You know, he'd go to UCLA and Miles would be pl playing there and he would, he'd play with his back to the audience. You know, and he, one could never know why he was doing this because Miles was one of those kind of theatrical kind of persons. It could be a, a thousand reasons for why. Oftentimes he turned his back to the audience so that he could hear his own group play. He could hear better if he faced them, you know. So you see eccentric behavior and, you know, people apply um, all kinds of characteristics to them and they're completely wrong, you know. And since I wasn't a musician, I had to, I was a second-hand kind of person. I had to live by records. You know, when I began to write uh, poetry, I, I wanted to play, I wanted to write like Lester Young played, you know. Because Lester Young was the most beautiful player in the world. But nobody could copy Lester Young. And not only that, he cursed all the time. He would modify his words with MF. It's just incredible, you know, how he could write in, write in tone and write in, write in uh, syllabic pacing. He could do this. And he, he was famous for giving people nicknames, nicknames. So Harry Sweets Edison, he'd call somebody Sweets, you know. So when I write a poem about Harry Sweets Edison, that's in deference to him giving the nickname to Sweets Edison, who, by the way, was an American Indian, you know. And there'll be a note to that effect. I'll tell you what you don't know about the fact that whether he, he was tribal or not, he had decided that he was going to give up everything in order to travel so he could be in Count Basie's band and to play with, with uh, Pops, Pops's, Louis Armstrong. They would do anything to be in company with one another whether there were any recording engineers or whatever around. So I was saturated in this. And why did I want to write poems about it? Because I'd never seen them in literature. Really? I'd never seen them written in literature. This was a long time before. I had seen it in Sterling Brown's The Negro Caravan, which came out in 1941. I'd seen it in that because he had written a, an introduction on folk literature. And Sterling Brown was a kind of genius. He knew everything, you know. He would write, a, write an, uh, an essay like The Blues as Folk Poetry, and then you would read it and you would realize that the, the blues actually has a convention of literacy. For example, he would write Southern Road, which is about people working on a chain gang. And I would, he, we'd be talking and I'd say, by the way, said, I, I'd say to him, as I introduce this book, can I say something about that poem? And he said, well, what did you have in mind? I said, well, what I have in mind is that it's a work song, but it has a narrative. And he would start grinning. He says, it sounds like you read that poem. Swing that hammer, mm. steady bow. Swing that hammer, mm. steady bow. So when I wrote the introduction to this, I was in South Africa. I dedicated the book to Sterling Brown. I had in mind, sitting in Johannesburg, Sterling Brown's tone, the way in which he would read a poem, his intonation. Like, for example, when you listen to uh, Agwan and Brooks read, for example, We Real Cool. We real cool. We left school. We. This is a ballad in eight lines. You know how difficult it is to write a ballad in eight lines. Well, she's a genius, so she can do it. But she's the only one that can do it. 
And of course, when she comes along and chooses my book and says, you are my clear winner, writes me a letter. I never heard of her, heard of her before. you never written to me. And he says, you are my clear winner. And then they want to publish my book. This gets you to be arrogant because even though you didn't win a prize, they wanted to publish your book. Then you get fearless, it's, it, which is the way I came to Brown. I came to Brown in 1970, and I demanded to have tenure. I, would, I said, I won't come without it. You know. So why did I say that? Well, I had gone through all kinds of funny changes at the places that I taught before, at Reed College, at here, at there. And I realized that academics cared more about tenure than they cared about quality. They didn't care about, about quality. So I would say things like, for example, Sterling Brown edited. This is called The Reader's, Guide to, Reader's Companion to World Literature. And there were three names on here, Hornstein, Percy, and Brown. Well, Brown is a Sterling Brown. So I was at his house one day, and I said to him, I said, by the way, I said, I was looking in the bibliography, and I noticed that uh, you had done some entries on the Reader's Guide to uh, World Literature. And he said, oh, yes, I had done that. I said, you, I noticed it was in the mid-50s. He said, yes. He says, I was a person that was taught when I was at Harvard to, um, how would he say? He would say it this way. Critical realism, he would say. The way in which you reverse stereotyping is to create a critical realism which will correct the bad things that have been done. And he would write an essay, Negro Characters as Seen by White Authors. And he would have read all of the 19th century literature, which was published in newspapers. How many people do you know have that, that kind of industry to want to know what your enemies are going to say? And then when I came to his house one day, this was 1974, uh, I said to him, I said, um, I noticed that um, you have trouble with Robert Penn Warren. Robert Penn Warren was the guy who wrote the book that I studied when I was an undergraduate called Understanding Poetry. Oh, yeah? That was the text, uh, Brooks and Warren. And at that time, I guess he, he was probably teaching at Yale or somewhere. But he was basically a Southerner. He was an agrarian. And so I said to Sterling one time, I said, uh, I said, what's your problem with him? He said, well, he said, he said a terrible thing to me. And he said it about my people. I said, well, what did he say? He said, well, you haven't looked that up? And I said, well, I know that he probably didn't say whatever you're angry about in his own voice. He said, no, he didn't. He said it was said in a folk tale. He had a folk person or a folk animal say, and then he would say, nigga, your breed ain't metaphysical. So this was 1974, so he was being interviewed, Washington Star. And a woman asked him about, nigga, your breed ain't metaphysical. And he came up with an answer. Cracker, your breed ain't exegetical. That was his answer. Cracker, your breed ain't exegetical. So, of course, I thought about metaphysics and exegesis. Exegesis, of course, comes from the Bible. It is explication, but it's more than explication. It's textual reading of the Bible. And then Kennedy comes to find out that his father was a preacher and had written Bible Mastery, which was the way of teaching illiterate uh, ministers how to interpret the Bible and know what was coming. Which is to say, if you're dealing with illiterate people and they have no tradition of literacy and they don't know what to lay out of the Bible, he went to Oberlin and studied it and then wrote a book about it. And of course, Sterling was the kind of person you'd visit him and he would give you a copy of what he wanted you to have. He knew that you were not going to get the book yourself. So when Chan of Saints came out, which is a book we edited, Stepto and I edited in the late 70s, he called up one day and he said, uh, what is it going to take for me to get a copy of this anthology that uh, you and Steptoe edited with my name on it? The Chant of Saints comes from his poem, When the Saints Go Marching Home. So I said, well, we're sending you a box of books. He said, well, he said, I've already given those away. This was a box of over 100. But Sterling had spent 40 years teaching, and he, people would come to his house. He would give everybody a book, you know. So I had to, I had to call up the, you know, the, the, uh, the um, University of Illinois Press and say, look, would you send Professor Brown some more books? Well, we just sent him. I said, yeah, but he's giving them away, you know. <laughs> and I don't want to argue with him. I said, you know, and it, 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 it's not that he won't pay for them. He will do that. But I want him to have a supply as long as he's alive. I want him to have a supply. All right, next question. 
Come on now. We have another taker? Come on. Don't be afraid. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Do you like ever become comfortable with your ability to write poems? Sure. There are times when there's nothing there. It's completely empty. The tank's empty. However, I was talking to Sterling about this one time. And I said to him, I said, you know, I noticed that you stopped writing poems in the late 1940s. He said, yeah. He says, most people think it's because they rejected my second book. He says, that's not the reason. He says, I was just too busy, you know, doing everything, teaching across the curriculum and this and that and the other. And I got to the point where I just couldn't write any poems anymore. I was just too busy doing other things, working on the Federal Writers Project, uh, being harassed by uh, the House American Activities Committee. He was never a communist, by the way. His best friends were people who would also were also being uh, bothered, like uh, Ralph Bunch, who was the first Nobel Prize winner, black, black American who won the Nobel Prize on Palestine, 1950. So Sterling was always in the middle of everything. Uh, and one time I asked him, I said, uh, I said, you know, Gene Toomer, I said, I was just at, at Yale a little while ago, and I was in the Beinecke Library. And I was looking in the James Weldon Johnson collection, and I saw a postcard with your name signed, Sterling. And I said, I know your handwriting. So I, I, I know that wasn't Mr. Sterling they were talking about. So I said to this woman, I said, incidentally, you've got this postcard filed under Sterling Brown's name, and Sterling Brown's handwriting is not like this. And the woman said, well, how am I going to authenticate it? I said, you can write him if you want to. You know, he probably won't answer you. But he has not, he doesn't write like this. So what, the reason why I'm telling you this is because even though you should have great respect for authority, you should also understand that sometimes your knowledge presupposes what collectors know, what archivists know, because your information is so much more reliable than somebody else's. Why? Because you know that person. You know your mother's handwriting, you know, and if you go to a context, a collection of letters, and you read your mother's handwriting, you can say, this is not my mother's handwriting. You know, now your mother might be illiterate. She might not be able to read and write at all, but you're not going to admit, admit that, you know, you're not going to admit she was, she was quote unquote stupid, you know, which is not illiterate at all. Stupid means one is uh, complacently inane, is what I would say. But for a person who is illiterate means somebody has stopped you from learning this. They have made it against the law for you to learn this. So you should have an attitude when somebody is so frightful of you being insightful about what you're looking at that they don't want you to be able to record what you've done. Well, Sterling would start there. You know, I don't know why my mother wants to stay here for her. This old world ain't been no friend to her. That is a perfect couplet. It comes from the spirituals. I don't know why my mother wants to stay here for this old world ain't been no friend to her. You know. All right. Next question. Yes. Um, yeah, I noticed that like in your poems, or in at least the ones we have to read from, illusion and literary illusion and cultural illusion plays a very, very strong role and like comes up a lot. Um, what, um, what do you think, like why would you use illusion so much? What do you think it adds to a poem, or what kind of layers do you think it contributes? What's your purpose in using so much illusion? I had good teachers, for one thing, beginning with my parents. My mother taught me how to read and write. I was four or five years old before I even went to kindergarten. My mother said to me once, she says, uh, Michael, why have you killed your ESP? I was a little kid, I don't know what around. I said, Mama, because it's so hard to live in the world. I hadn't even been to kindergarten yet. But the thought of having to leave the magic circle of one's own family in order to deal with everybody in kindergarten at five years old was trauma for me, you know. Now, why was I traumatized? Well, I was traumatized because my mother had in her household my grandmother, her mother, 
And uh, when she died, she died. She had a series of strokes, and she died uh, when I was in the fourth grade. It's 1947. And my mother came to me one day in the morning, and she says, I want you to come say goodbye to Grandma. My mother was always walking around whispering and stuff. She didn't want my brother and sister to hear this. So she'd come and get me, and she took me in, and she says, I want you to say goodbye. And I remember going into my grandmother's bedroom and seeing her and being relieved that she was gone because my mother had to take care of her. You didn't put people in nursing homes in. My mother was walking her around and a series of strokes, you know, which happened over four or five years during World War, World War II. When you internalize these kind of things, um, you don't realize that they're sacred to you. They're just your grandparents and your grandmother. My grandfather, I was born at home. And I was born in 1938, and I, my grandfather died in 1940. So I have almost no memory of him at all. But he was my mother's favorite. Uh, and, she, and my mother used to talk to him, you know. She'd be walking in the house, and she would, she'd, start, she'd start chattering. And I'd say, well, Mama, who are you talking to? She said, well, I'm talking to my father, you know. So what this does is it, is, is, is it takes the mystery out of the various um, dimensions of time, you know. And you're not frightful of this because you are at ease with the belief system that the people that surround you are, and particularly your mother, you know. My mother was one of the smartest people in the world. She only went to one. She went only went to one year of high school, one, one year of college. She went to a school in, in Prince Springfield, uh, Massachusetts, and her best friend was a woman named uh, what's her name, Louis. She used to call her Louis, meaning uh, Lois was her name. And later on, you realize that you haven't written a poem about Louis. And you, say, you, st you sit down and you think to yourself, well, do I have anything to say about this? Well, no, I don't have anything to say about it. But then, by that time, my mother had gone to visit Louie and her husband in Connecticut. They were all grown. I was teaching at Brown. And um, my mother said that uh, she had learned to appreciate Mexican silver because this woman had a silver collection. Well, that started the ball rolling, you know. And the next thing you know, I'd written a poem about it and published it in a Philadelphia newspaper. Somebody wrote to me and said, have, do you have anything that you, you have handy right now that you've just written? And I said, well, I just wrote this, and I sent it to him. Well, she saw this. Louis saw this. She, saw, she said, you mean to tell him, you, you've written this poem about me? I said, well, your name is down there. I dedicated it to you, you know. Nobody know who knows who Lois is. I know who Lois is, and my mother knows who Lois is, and that's all that matters. You know, my mother knows that you two are friends. So the business about what um, legislates a poem is very mysterious. Yeah, it's very mysterious, and sometimes you have no reason. For example, I had never read Keats's letters when I was in class in school. But the minute that I started to teach Keats, then I began to read his letters and to make my students read the letters. And I would tell the students, I said, look, before you decide that you're going to marry John, make sure that John has written you the kind of letter that John Keats wrote to his girlfriend, you know. And of course, they would think this is preposterous, you know. Can I interrupt you to ask how many people have read Keats's letters? See, I find this amazing. I discovered this last semester. Right. It's amazing how few people. You all, they all have to. They all have to go out and read Keats' letters. Don't you? Well, I mean, well, you, if you want to understand Michael Harper, you have to understand this. I, I, I just happen to bring a poem along. Yeah, go. That uh, will give you some idea about why I, I do the things I do and why I do them in the way I do them. Uh, I was. Uh, uh, we had a woman in our department named Ruth Oppenheim, and she had been a child who had experienced Kristallnacht, which is in 1938 was the destroying of, yes. And I didn't really know that I was even going to write this poem, but I came to her. She was getting ready to leave the English department, and I came to her and I said, Mrs. O, I always call it, we all call her Mrs. O. I said, Mrs. O, I said, I have a uh, poem that I want to write for you, and I want to um, give you a copy of it. 
And uh, she said, oh, really? You know, she was very quiet, unassuming. And I began to um, fool around with this poem. And the next thing you know, I didn't know, I didn't remember the story, except that she had told me a little bit about it. But I had I'd looked up Crystal Knot. I'd looked it up, and I realized I had been to Germany, for example. I traveled around in Germany, and I had understood that the Germans were very, very touchy about what they wanted to talk about and what they didn't want to talk about. And so I decided that I would just, you know, write the poem for her and not think very much about it. Well, I wrote it, and I kept a copy of it, and I just put it in my file cabinet, and I didn't think any more about it. Then, years went by. Uh, I think this was Bowdoin College, and Bowdoin College wanted to do a, a, they were honoring me for some reason in the, mids, in the mid 90s, and they wanted to have um, um, memorabilia from me. So I had these two students, uh, and I said, look, I don't want to be involved with this, uh, but you are welcome to go down in my uh, file cabinets and take anything you want, you know, if you can find. So she went down in my file cabinets, which are in the basement of where my office is now. My office is in Wilbur Hall, right next to the Rock. And I've got three offices. I've got an office connected with another on the third floor. And then I've got, uh, I've got an office at home, of course. And then I've got a storage place on the ground floor of Wilbur Hall. So they went into the ground floor, and they, went looking for, and they came across this poem. And they said, uh, wh why do we have this poem? I said, because you've been in my file cabinet. You know, well, can we get permission for you? For the, I said, no, you can't have permission. I said, the poem doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Mrs. Oppenheim. Why don't you ask her? And if she gives you permission, then you can put it in the exhibition. So, of course, they went across the street and talked talk to Mrs. Oppenheim, and she was pleased that they had discovered this, and even more pleased that it was going to be in an exhibition. But basically, I didn't want her to be embarrassed, you know. So I didn't think any more about it. Well, of course, where did I get the idea? Well, I got the idea from Keats's letters and negative capability. And the um, um, what am I trying to say here? Keats wrote poems because he was intimidated by the people that had preceded him. Now, who could they be? John Milton, for one. You know, Shakespeare, the big people. You know, he was just a little guy. You know, he died when he was 25. You know, he's dead already. And he was a medical doctor, too. Little short little guy. But he was a genius in many ways. So that's why I put her in that frame, because I wanted her to understand she was that important to me as Keats was to me. But Keats was not important to me while I was going to school and reading. It became important to me later on when I started to teach, you know. So here's a poem. Very interesting about how you do this. The Ghost of Soul Making, it's called. And Keats has, in one of his letters, something that he calls veil, V-A-L-E, of soul making, in one of his letters. So that kind of rang a bell. So I changed the veil to ghost. The Ghost of Soul Making for Ruth Oppenheim. It has two epigraphs. On that day it was decreed who shall live and who shall die. Yom Kippur prayer. And the other, art in its ultimate always celebrates the victory. So, here's the poem. The ghost appears in the dark of winter, sometimes in the light of summer, in the light of spring, confronts you behind the half door in the first shock of morning, often after hours with bad memories to stunt your day, winds in twilight, winds in the umbrella of trees. He stands outside the locked doors, rain or shine. He constructs the stunt work of allegiances in the form of students, in the form of the half measure of blankets. He comes to parade rest in the itch of frost on the maple, on the cherry caught in the open field of artillery. He remembers the battlefields of the democratic order. He marks each accent through the gates of the orchard, singing in the cadence of books. You remember books burned, a shattering of crystals, prayers for now and in the afterlife, Germany, Germany, 
of the northern lights of Kristallnacht, the ashes of synagogues. The ghost turns to your mother as if he believed in penance and wages earned. In truth, places these flowers you have brought with your own hands, irises certainly, and the Dalmatian rose, whose fragrance calms every hunger in religious feast or fast. Into her hands, these blossoms of fragrant palms. There is no wedding ring in the life of ghosts, no sacred asp on the wrist in imperial cool, but there is a bowl on the reception table, offerings of swish black rick licorice. On good days, the bowl would entice the dream of husband, children, and grandchildren. On good days, one could build a synagogue in one's own city, call it city of testimony, conscious city of words. In this precinct, male and female, the ghost commences, the ghost disappears. What of the lady in the half door of the Enlightenment? Tact and a few scarves, a small indulgence for a frugal woman. Loyalty learned in the lost records of intricate relations. How to remember, how to forget the priceless injuries on a steno tablet in the tenured cabinets of the files. At birth and before, the ghost taught understanding that no history is fully a record, for the food we will eat is never sour on the tongue, lethal or not, as a defenseless scapegoat, the tongue turned over as compost is turned over to sainthood, which makes the palate sing. These are jewels in the service of others. This is her song. She reaps the great reward of praise where answers do not answer, when the self unleashed from the delicate bottle, wafts over the trees at sunrise and forgives the dusk. So there's an essay which is written and it uses this poem and frames Ruth Alventine's life. That's going to be published somewhere by a Brown graduate who knew her. And she's, uh, this person just sent it to me, so I printed it out. And I don't know whether I sent it to you, but you're welcome to have it if oh, you I, like. I would love it, yeah. Can I tell you one more thing, though? Sure. It's almost time to go. So can I, can, can I ask you, you had mentioned there's a poem about the Athenaeum? Yes. Yes, yes, um, indeed. And that, so if you could read that, because we're going to the Athenaeum in a couple weeks, a month, like that. and uh, it'd be great if you read that poem. And then before you go, you got to thank you. Well, you can thank me. It's, it's all right. <laughs> so. Um... I can't find these. I can't find my own books and my own poems in my own books. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it'll it'll come to me in a minute if, as long as I don't uh, get too worked up. Don't get too worked up. Yeah. Right. Um, while you're doing that, uh, tell everybody Friday. Yellow wallpaper. Paper topics on the course web page now. We'll talk about paper topics on Friday. Um, <laughs> There's no type. Uh, trying to think if I have any other announcements. Um, uh, you know, I, when I get worked up too, I can't talk. I, I, you know, the poem, Michael, that, that last poem, it was, uh, it was poem was, um, Well, that's one of the reasons why I told you that I, I don't like to plan is because, you know, when you come into a classroom and you talk about uh, things, you know, you, can, you, you wander all over the place, and I do uh, a lot because I've taught a lot, and teaching is more important to me than, than, than writing is really in most cases. Is that true? Really? Yeah. Oh, that's it is, it, it is important to me. Oh. And uh, I it's more important than writing. It, 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 yeah, because I don't, I don't write full time. I don't, I, and I, often, I find that I don't write uh, when I'm teaching. I have to be away from teaching to, to, to write my poems. And uh, I find it difficult for people uh, who have the kind of balance or genius or whatever it takes to write poems when they are preoccupied with other things. And, uh, you know, if you're teaching, um, it takes everything, at least for me. That's a re remarkable thing to say at Brown, not because teaching is important, but because, you know, the way the modern university works, writing in various forms is more important for a lot of people than teaching. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes. Uh, the person that I wrote the poem for is named his name is William Strickland, S-T-R-I-C-K-L-A-N-D. 
and it's called Letter of Athenian Couplets in Memory of William Strickland, and it's written in couplets. There are golden fish in the waters of the temple, tablets, tabernacle, toll gate, when the mummy speaks, and banks at the watersheds on Egyptian paper, for Egyptians did not play in their sacred scrolls. Strickland knew the watershed of the Delaware Indians. Perhaps he felt the broken treaties at the Cumberland at Nashville on the Trail of Tears. Perhaps his theory of the column was no liberty bell. There was the theory of the temple in windowless light and of the mime mine at play in the face of a child. The child read into the night with a bright lamp of travel. Fans of displacement, hostages, civil strife were written down in the honest, honest materials of the Confederacy and of the Union. As Lincoln said, the prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. Out of discord in the epistyle of his own nexus of rivers, out of surveyor's level came the ghost-written Parthenon, his embers flag and heel on short supplies at the breaking point of a new bank building. It is a city-state of antebellum ease, morose isosceles triangle in the nation's trade. How one stands on fallen arches of the National Railroad, how one talks at the singed lines of embarkation, of design. The fish are Masonic orders with their hidden ritual of order. There are mutant joys of ornament, battle stations of space and song. So there's a note, note uh, about Strickland. It tells you a little bit about him. But the point is, is that if you go down at the Athenaeum, my kids grew up in the Athenaeum. I would buy membership because they had a wonderful uh, collection of children's books. And I would tell my kids, I said, I want you to go down in the Athenaeum and spend the weekend down there finding anything you want to read. And it costs money to be a member. And my kids, of course, were members because they were little kids. And I wanted them not to hate the library. Now, they, they might hate the rock, but they, I don't want them to hate the Athenaeum, you know. So they were members, and I still have a membership in the, in the, in the Athenaeum, even though I don't use it myself. My kids grew up reading books because books were important. I want to thank you for inviting me. Hey, thank you, Michael. Please.